All right, y'all. So this is my kind of long-term review of the Samsung Galaxy S23 Ultra. So I've been using it for a little bit over a month now. And so I will tell you right off the bat that Samsung did the thing with this phone. Now. I think that's what the kids are saying these days. Anyway, I'm getting old. So that's corny. But anyway, um, so the first thing that I think people will notice is that the design is really not that much different as far as the looks are concerned compared to the S22 Ultra from last year. Um, the biggest thing you will notice is just the different colors uh, that you have as far as options this year's with the uh, S23 Ultra. And if you do want some more exclusive colors, they do have some on their website compared to what you can find from the stores and stuff. But um, I still find the issue that on the back here with the camera modules, dust and lint and stuff like that just really starts to collect over time. And there's really no way around that. Um, that just happens. But I am typically a case person. I usually use a case on my smartphones. But this phone has made me kind of change my mind a little bit because the phone feels a lot better to hold in your hand because they have made the size of the phone flatter this year. They're not completely flat. They're just more boxier. And along with making the display less curved this year, this is one of the best big feeling phones to hold in my hand because I feel like I just have more of a, a grip and a really good secure hold on it compared to the, the S22 Ultra, which is more rounded, right? It's a little bit more of a rounded feeling. So I love the boxy squareness of this phone. And I think uh, we're going to see a lot more phones start to move over to flatter displays and also boxier looks. And I'm not mad at that. But when I flip this phone around, we still have one of the best screens that you can get on a smartphone to date. So this comes in at 6.8 inches. It still can run at 120 hertz. And when you're gaming on it, it's just fun to use, whether you're handheld or you're using like a smartphone controller like the Razer Kishi or the Backbone controller, which they have one that works with Android now. And I really like the fact that smartphone gaming controllers have been able to accommodate big phones like this now. So um, yeah, gaming experience on this, just because of how big the screen is, is pretty nice. Um, but then also too, the sound is really good. You have dual speakers that do get loud and they do have a like a full feeling to them. So uh, gaming has been really fun, whether you're playing a game that you downloaded from the Play Store or maybe you're doing some game streaming via Xbox or something. Uh, this phone is just great for that. Now I will say that I did notice that the S23 Ultra did get a little bit warmer in my gaming sessions compared to something like the OnePlus 11 that has a revamped cooling chamber and stuff on the inside of it. So it's not a big deal. I wasn't like concerned with the heat um, on the S23 Ultra, but I just did notice coming from my OnePlus 11 review that it was a little bit warmer. Um, but outside of that, even if you're not gaming, this phone performs very well um, because you have the Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 chipset inside of this. And new this year is that Samsung doesn't have an Exynos version of this phone. So no matter where you buy this phone in the world, it will come with the Snapdragon 8 Gen 2. So that's a good thing as far as consistency. But also this chipset rocks because I didn't have any point of stutter or lag or anything when I've been using One UI 5.1 on this phone. And it is running on top of Android 13 this year. And uh, this phone will be getting five years of security updates and four years of Android updates. So um, in 2017, you'll still get an Android update. So that's a pretty good long time. You can still do Samsung DeX. So wirelessly or wired, you can connect to a monitor or a TV and basically turn this into like a little mini computer. And I don't really use Samsung DeX that often, but knowing that I have that capability is pretty great. And you still have the S Pen that lives in the body of the phone. You can pull it out and you do cool things like taking notes and you know drawing with it. Obviously, you can still use it as a remote shutter for the phone. So if you want to take like a, a photo of yourself outside or a group photo, uh, you can prop the phone up and then just press on the button on the stylus and do that. So um, the stylus is great for me for signing contracts and again, taking those occasional notes. And I really like the way the widgets stack on top of each other and they perform very well. And then also I love this battery widget, just keeping me um, updated on the battery life of these S Pen, of my Galaxy watch that I'm wearing and also the phone. Um, but they do have some other new features with uh, One UI with this phone. And one is going to be the uh, Bixby Spam Calling Assistant. I think that's the official name of it. I might have messed that up. But anyway, um, if you do get a call and you might suspect that it is spam, you can have Bixby take the call for you just like this. Hi, I'm using Bixby Text Call to convert your voice into text and respond to you. If you want to continue, Say who you are and why you're calling. Hey, this is Mark, and I'm just calling to see if our appointment is still on. I can't talk right now. I'll call you back later. 
And so besides the little pre-recorded responses that you can customize and make your own, you can also type a response live as the call is going on and then Bixby will go ahead and speak what you just typed in. So this is useful for all those spam calls that we're all getting these days. It seems like it's getting worse, but yeah, this feature is cool to kind of help combat that. And you can mess around with them a little bit and hopefully make their days a little bit worse too. <laughs> And something else that you can do that is familiar coming from iOS is the fact that now you can tap and hold on an object or person or dog in a photo. And then now you can drag and drop this into another app if you are using um, another app via like split screen on this. Um, or you can also just take that photo and add it to a video like this. And a little off topic here, but yes, Gadget did pass away a few years ago. I do get that question from time to time. Um, so yeah, she was a good dog. And so that's one of the reasons why you don't see her in my uh, smartphone reviews anymore. I used to take photos of her all the time but now she is in puppy heaven and shout out to all my dog owners out there because it hit me really hard i didn't know how hard it would be um, losing a uh, a pet like this um, so i do still have riley this is my uh, wife's dog here um, but now our dog so he's holding on he's like 17 years old so he's an old man um, but yeah shout out to all the dog owners and also gadget and uh, yeah she's been a good subject in all of my smartphone reviews but i'll interject her in all my videos as much as i can <laughs> without annoying you guys but anyway i think this is a good time to switch over and start talking about the camera. So right out the gate, this is the most complete camera system on any smartphone right now. So you have new sensors this year. You have different megapixel counts. So the front facing camera does have a smaller megapixel count, but the photos to me do look a little bit better. So that's a good thing, especially when you are taking selfies and portrait mode selfies and things like that. So I'm very happy with the front facing camera performance. Um, but on the back, you will be finding a new 200 megapixel sensor that you can use. And this will allow you to take a photo and then just double tap and basically hyper zoom in. But even though you're zoomed in, you still have a very nice crisp image. Now, when I was taking a 50 or a 200 megapixel photo, I did find that the camera sometimes would overcompensate for the exposure. So I have it a little bit higher to kind of like brighten up the details, but sometimes that can bring in more noise into the photo. So I just kind of played around a little bit and I would turn down the exposure and I find that I was able to get just a better photo. So keep that in mind when you are taking these photos at higher megapixels. Now, as far as shutter lag, so when you press that button in the camera app, there is like a half a second that you need to make sure like you hold that pose or whatever uh, before you allow the uh, the camera to go ahead and snap that photo and process it. So, it, you know, it's gotten better over the years, but something that you still kind of have to keep that little half a second in your head when you are taking pictures. And then you also do have a 50 megapixel uh, option that you can still take. So this is going to be a little bit of a smaller file size, but also to uh, gives you that ability to zoom in a little bit. But 200 megapixels is pretty incredible, but you still have the 100 times space zoom that you can use on this phone. So uh, basically this phone has three times and 10 times optical zoom. And those are going to be the really ideal sweet spots when you are trying to zoom in and maintain the best quality. And then when you start to kind of pinch in and zoom or just go to the higher levels, it's going to start using that digital processing and, and stuff a little bit more. And just from my experience, when I'm outside with a decent amount of sunlight, anything up to 30 times zoom, I'm going to be very happy to take that photo and use it and share it on social media or use it for a video or something. But above that, you know, the detail just really starts to kind of lose itself. Um, it is better. Like it, you can get something really good, especially if you are taking photos of uh, stationary objects and stuff. But, you know, it's one of those things where I like to use uh, 30 times zoom outside and kind of stop at that. But when I am indoors or in a, like a, a low light situation, I would say the 10 times zoom is kind of where I want to stop at, where that photo still looks really crisp. Um, once you go to 30 times zoom, like I'm doing here at Monday Night Raw that came to St. Louis not that long ago, um, you can see that, you know, it's, it can be hit and miss, right? Especially if your subject is moving, you're going to see a little bit more motion blur and stuff um, in that particular photo. But if you are taking a photo of a stationary object like this WrestleMania sign here, you can still get something really good at 30 times zoom. It's just that, you know, most of the times I'm trying to take photos of people or things moving and stuff, um, 10 times zoom indoors or outside in low light is going to be the sweet spot for me. And to be honest with you, I only really use the 100 times space zoom completely maxed out when I just see something that's interesting and I just want to kind of use it like binoculars to be able to see what's going on like this guy having a great time by himself at the uh, St. Louis Battlehawks game so I really use it to kind of see something that I can't really see from my current vantage point but again it's something that's cool to play around with but not something that I would practically use every single day. Now I'm quickly just going to address this whole moon controversy that Samsung found itself in where if you do use space zoom like I'm doing here now um, and you point that this phone at the moon and then you take a photo 
it actually will adjust the exposure and all that stuff and use its knowledge of how the moon looks to be able to give you a really good, nice looking photo of the moon. So some people call this faking it. Some people just look at it like me, where it's just kind of enhancing um, the moon. And I don't see it as faking it, but it is uh, applying some kind of artificial work to it um, and the knowledge of, of what the software has to make that moon look as good as possible. So personally, I don't have an issue with it, but I think this is a good, important conversation to have. And it's a good thing that these companies are becoming aware that we are going to be, you know, checking them on this stuff as they start to use AI for photo enhancement more and more. Because I think if it ever gets to the point to when you take a photo of someone and the phone then says, hey, let me let me look through all of your other previous photos and find where you have a better smile and then take that smile and then put it on this photo. That's where I think I, I would probably draw the line there or at least want a lot of transparency with that. But until we get to that point, the moon, I'm not that mad at, at, at how they do it um, because it still looks really, really good. Um, so we'll see how this thing evolves over time. Now let's get to something that no one can really complain about. And that is the edge detection that you get with portrait mode photos is some of the best in the game. It does a good job at cutting my head, even with my hairline kind of distracting it because it's going back and back further, further every year. But um, also with these electric bikes that I, I start to review now where they have a lot of cables and stuff hanging out and then um, a lot of the phones that I use to take portrait mode photos usually have those cables blurry and stuff, but this phone did the best job at uh, giving me an opportunity to get a photo that had everything in focus and that background nice and blurry. So it didn't nail it every single time, but it did give me a, a really good photo more times than not compared to other phones. And so look, I could spend a lot of time talking about the color accuracy of the photos and really getting into details like that, but I'm not because I'm just showing you the stuff that I took. I'm not a professional photographer, but I've been pretty happy at taking photos no matter what time of the day it is, no matter where I'm at. So one of the best camera phones out there that you'll find. But now let me get into the video recording and I'm really not gonna talk about 4K at all. I'm gonna show you the 8K video that I've been able to take with this phone because new this year is that you can take 8K video at 30 frames per second. Previously, it's been locked at 24 frames per second. So for me, it's better so I can integrate that 8K 30 video into content that I create because I typically film at 30 frames per second or 60 or 120. And so if I wanted to use 24 frames per second, you know, the video would be compromised a little bit. And just like I mentioned before, when I was taking 200 megapixel photos while recording 8K video, it did sometimes overexpose. So I would, you know, dial that down and you can see this video clip of me doing that in real time. And then that just allowed the, the video to, again, have less noise and just look better. But even outside of that, that 8K video does give you a little bit extra resolution if you do want to crop in a little bit, not too much, but if you do want to crop in a little bit, you're still going to get better detail, just like you are getting like with a 200 megapixel photo. So it's good for that. But I did an entire video when I was walking around New York City and I just used this phone recording the AK video and I walked away really impressed, especially at the stabilization. So most of this footage I'm showing you now is completely handheld and previously AK video on smartphones was just super shaky. So you didn't want to use it just for that um, aspect of it. But yeah, the stabilization is on point because they do have um, a new optical image stabilization system in this phone. So it also helps with photos, but especially for video recording. So 8K video is legit now on this phone. This is the first phone that I've used where I'm really proud to use the 8K video. So go check out my video that I'll leave link below in the description of this video so you can see that full 8K video that I did in New York. Oh, and one thing I noticed when I was spending all day recording 8K video is that the battery life on this phone is super impressive. It's up there with the iPhone 14 Pro Max um, because you're able to get a full days of use with no questions asked. But I honestly can be very safe in saying that this is a true day and a half phone as well. And you still have reverse wireless charging on this phone, so you can put another phone or some pair of wireless earbuds on the back and charge it. Um, you have 15 watt wireless charging and then you have 45 watt wired charging. So the charging speeds are fine, but compared to some other Android competitors out there that really have like 100 watt fast charging these days, it looks a little slow compared to that, but it's still not bad at all. Oh, and this phone does have a larger ultrasonic fingerprint scanner that lives underneath the display, so you have less of an opportunity to miss that fingerprint button here, so it's been working pretty well for me. And yeah, I think that's about it as far as like all of the features and specs and things, but if I had to really give this phone a compliment, I would say that if I could only choose one device to use for the rest of the year, like I couldn't use a laptop, I couldn't use a, a TV or whatever, I would choose this phone. And if you are a Galaxy S22 Ultra user and you're thinking about going up to the S23 Ultra, but you're like, man, it's just been a year since I got this phone. I will tell you that I was a little bit hesitant in the beginning, but I will say with the design changes and some of the camera 
changes and just the overall battery life that you get. This will be one of those upgrades that if you come in from the phone from the previous year that I think you will notice the upgrades and you might come to appreciate them as far as your everyday daily life when you're using this phone. But all of this goodness does come at a price. So this phone starts at $1,200 for the 256 gigabyte version and then you can upgrade to 512 and all the way up to one terabyte of storage. But you're gonna be paying a pretty penny for that. But if there is a $1,200 phone that does deserve this price, uh, this is definitely the phone. Uh, but one thing I would like to see maybe as a suggestion for me would be a smaller version of this phone, kind of similar to what Apple does with the iPhone 14 Pro and the Pro Max. And that can definitely you know drop the price and you will have a smaller display and a smaller battery and they might have to take out that S Pen. But I think that would be, to be a good option for people who want a smaller phone because this is a big phone, but also want to save some money. So maybe they can get rid of the S23 Plus or something like that and just keep the s23 and have the ultra and the ultra max or whatever they want to call it but that's just kind of something i just thought of right now but let me know what you think about that but also the moon controversy and everything else i talked about this phone in this video down below in the comments i will appreciate seeing your thoughts about this but like always i do want to thank you for watching this video and i will catch you later peace